Today we've got an integral that is going to use a lot of really nice tricks that I think you can learn a lot from. So we've got the integral from 0 to 1 of the cosine of the natural log of x over 2 minus x dx. And along the way we're going to make use of Euler's formula for the complex exponential which says that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. And then by the evenness of cosine and the oddness of sine, that means that e to the minus i theta is cosine theta minus i sine theta, which allows us to solve for both cosine and sine. We'll solve for cosine and get it as 1 half e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta. But we've actually got a couple of steps before we're going to use this. I'm going to write our given integral as well, half of itself plus half of itself, which is clearly a whole of itself. Okay, so let's do that. So we have one half the integral from zero to one of cosine of natural log of x over two minus x dx, plus, like I said, another half of the same thing. And then I'm gonna do a quick step by erasing and rewriting. And I'm going to use the fact that the natural log of the reciprocal of something is negative the natural log of what we started with. And so I can replace this x over 2 minus x with a 2 minus x over x. But that's going to pick up a minus sign right here. But then because cosine is an even function, this minus sign right here can disappear because cosine of theta is the same thing as cosine of negative theta. Okay, so that's our tricky step that we did right there. Okay, and now I'm going to perform a substitution on each of these integrals. And well, it's going to be a related substitution. So for this first integral, we're going to take u and we'll set it equal to x over 2 minus x. But then inverting that substitution, you can see pretty quickly that that means that x is equal to 2u over u plus 1. I'll let you do that calculation if you need to. And then that means that dx is equal to 2du over u plus 1 squared. Again, that's a pretty simple calculation. Now, let's see what happens to the bounds of integration in this case. So when x is equal to 0, that means that u is equal to 0. And then when x is equal to 1, that means that u is equal to 1. So the bounds of integration don't really change here. Okay, so let's put a yellow box around this. And, well, just point out that we are using it for this integral right here. Okay, nice. And now, maybe before we rewrite this, let's go ahead and talk about the substitution for our second integral as well, which that'll be to set u as 2 minus x over x, which shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Here we're taking u and setting it equal to the argument of the log. And well, we're doing the same thing in that second integral. Okay. So next up, we can invert this substitution, and we'll see that x is equal to 2 over u plus 1. But then we'll see that dx is equal to minus 2 du over u plus 1 squared. Simply taking the derivative, that's pretty straightforward. Now, let's see. If x is equal to 0, that means that u is equal to, or I guess I should say u approaches positive infinity, because here what's really happening is u is not equal to zero, it is approaching zero from above. And then when x is equal to one, uh, you'll see that u is also equal to one. Okay, and then let's maybe put a pink box around this substitution and just point out that we're using it for this integral right here. Okay, so now let's make that substitution or make each of these substitutions. So notice that we've got a 2 from this first substitution as well as this second substitution, and we've got a half in front of each integral. So I'll let those 2s and halves annihilate each other. 
And then here we'll have our integral from zero to one of the cosine of the natural log of u over u plus one squared du. So that's what happens to our first integral. And then for our second one, well, I'm gonna take this minus sign and bring it out front. So we'll have minus the integral from infinity to one based off of how the bounds of integration changed of, well, if you look at everything, it's the same argument or integrand. So this is again, the cosine of the log of u over u plus one quantity squared du. But observe now what I'll do is take this minus sign and use it to switch the order of the bounds of integration. And then we can push these two integrals together. So now we'll have an integral from zero to infinity. So let's do that. So we've got the integral from zero to infinity of the cos of natural log of u over u plus one squared du. So that's looking pretty good at the moment. But next up, what we'll do is employ our formula over here for the cosine in terms of this exponential. So let's do that. Observe that we're gonna pick up a half out front and then we have our integral from zero to infinity. And we've got this u plus one squared, which is gonna stay in the denominator. And then we'll have an e to the i uh, natural log of u plus an e to the minus i natural log of u du. But now I can simplify this quite a bit. So notice that I can take this i and by exponent rules, bring it inside of the natural log. So we've got u to the i in there. And we'll do the same thing right here for this minus i. Here we'll have natural log of u to the minus i. But then of course, e or the exponential function and the natural log are inverses of each other. So we can rewrite this as one half and then the integral from zero up to infinity of u to the i plus u to the minus i over u plus one quantity squared du. And our next step is to do yet another substitution. And the substitution we'll do here is to set t equal to u over u plus one but then we can pretty easily invert that to see that u is equal to t over one minus t. And then we can also see that dt is equal to du over u plus one squared. So there, we've got our du over u plus one squared. That's exactly this dt term. And then let's also observe that if u is equal to zero, we see that t is equal to zero. And as u approaches infinity, we see that t approaches one. So that's gonna change this as follows. So now we'll have one half the integral from zero to one. And observe, like I said, the du over u plus one squared is now dt, so we don't really need to worry about that. So we'll have t over one minus t to the i. So let's write that down. T over one minus t raised to the i power. And then we'll have t over one minus t raised to the minus i power, but we might as well write that as plus uh, one minus t over t raised to the i power dt. Okay, good. But then by symmetry, you can split that into two integrals and then make a new substitution to see that each of those are equal. And they're in fact equal to, well, either of those versions that you wanna leave. I'll leave that as a bit of a homework exercise. So we might as well write that as the integral from zero to one of t times one minus t to the minus i dt, where, well, I combined those two equal integrals and had them get rid of this half here. Okay, so we're almost done, so let's see where we can take it from there. Okay, so here's where we ended up on the last board. I fixed a bit of a typo where we left off the i and the exponent of t. Now I'm gonna rewrite this in a kind of a funny way, but we'll see why that will be useful. We've got the integral from zero to one. We're gonna write this as t to the power one plus i minus one times one minus t raised to the power one minus i minus one dt. 
And we're doing that because this is exactly the formation of something called the beta function, which we've done some videos on the channel before. So this is in fact the beta function evaluated at one plus i and one minus i. So that's a two variable function. But now what we can do is use a formula that relates the beta function to the gamma function. And let's just recall that real quick. That says the beta function evaluated at z and w is equal to the gamma function evaluated at z times the gamma function evaluated at w over the gamma function evaluated at z plus w. Okay, so let's put a box around that so we recall it. So that means here what we have is the gamma function evaluated at one plus i and then times the gamma function evaluated at one minus i over the gamma function evaluated at their sum. But their sum is two. And let's recall that the gamma function evaluated at two is just one. Based off, well, you can do the easy integral that defines the gamma function or recall that gamma function evaluated at two is exactly one factorial. So next up, we're gonna use a formula for the gamma function or a characteristic of the gamma function that says that gamma of z plus one is equal to, let's see, z times gamma of z. So let's see, we can use that to rewrite this first incidence of the gamma function as i times the gamma function evaluated at i times the gamma function evaluated at one minus i. And then finally, we've got one more formula, this so-called gamma reflection formula, which we made a video on the channel of before that says gamma of one minus z times gamma of z is in fact equal to pi over the sine of pi times z. But that's exactly what we have here. Well, times i, of course. So that's going to give us uh, pi times i over the sine of pi times i. But the sine of pi times i is, well, it's related to the complex exponential based off of a formula over here. And I'll let you do the little bit of calculation that's required, but all of that will take us home to our final answer here, which is two pi over e to the pi minus e to the minus pi. And that's a good place to stop.